living system on our beloved planet is an eloquent expression of the universe's astonishing ability to come into perfect balance and then to do what life is meant to do, to thrive. Thriving is the natural flow of life. Consider what is surely one of the greatest wonders of all, how a tiny egg and a single irrepressibly plucky sperm can unleash a process that brings forth in the end another one of us, a being of vast ability and unlimited potential, with a brain capable of complex and soaring self-reflection, legs made to dance and run, fingers nimble enough to weave a basket play a violin, caress a face. If nature teaches us anything, it is that life is meant to work, and that like every living thing, our purpose is to thrive. And yet, for the majority of people on the planet, life is not about thriving. It's about surviving, just trying to hang on. Is this really the best we can do? Did the universe labor for nearly 14 billion years only to bring forth a species that would end up as an enemy to life itself and to its own home? I don't think so. My name is Foster Gamble, and I have spent nearly a lifetime trying to figure out what happened. What is happening that could account for the staggering agony and deprivation on this planet? As a young man, Driven by the misery I saw and by my fear for our survival, I set out on a journey seeking to answer questions like, is it even possible for humans to thrive? If so, why aren't we? My research led me to places I never expected to go, revealing surprising discoveries that seemed unrelated at first, but which turned out to be crucially connected, as you'll see. I found a code a pattern in nature that's been embedded in arts and icons throughout the centuries. I believe this code holds the key to a new source of clean, sustainable energy that could completely revolutionize the way all people live. I came to understand how our economic system is rigged, and I found out what we can do about it. My journey revealed ways we can claim our power to create liberating, healthy systems everywhere on Earth. I have realized that we are not a mistake. We are simply mistaken. We've been blinded to our brilliance, shorn of our strength, ignorant of our genius, unaware of our true power and magnificence. But all that is about to change. I invite you to share with me the highlights of my unlikely journey. I've created this navigator to take us through time and space. Let me show you around. On this screen, we can access what I call our vitals. It's the critical data we don't get from the corporate media, which in the US has consolidated from 50 companies down to five in just over 25 years. We'll use this to check on how we're really doing. The right screen tracks how to chart a healthy, sustainable course for living on planet Earth. I call these the navigating insights. And this will be our compass. Instead of a needle seeking north in our Earth's magnetic field, our compass is the shape of the field itself. And that shape, as you will soon see, has amazing technological and social ramifications. After a lifetime quest, I've come to believe that this pattern actually holds the key to a world that works for everyone. So let's go.
I grew up in a world of privilege and power, attending elite private schools and then Princeton University. As a direct descendant of one of the founders of Procter & Gamble, I was groomed to be a leader in the establishment, but I chose a different path. I began to wake up when I was in elementary school. Adults were teaching me that the way to protect myself from a nuclear explosion was to duck under my desk and cover my head. That's when my serious questioning began. A couple of years later, I had a direct experience of universal energy. It happened one day when I was riding on a school bus, gazing out the window. I had a vision of a whirlpool pattern and I just knew that the flow of energy I was seeing was the same in an atom as in our entire solar system. I felt deeply that I, too, was somehow made of that same pattern. This vision was what originally got me into science, into trying to figure out how the universe works and how we humans fit into the overall pattern of life energy. Years later, I learned that the pattern I saw is known by some in the scientific world. It turns out that in 1921, Albert Einstein got a Nobel Prize for discovering that when energy is released in the universe, there are little packets of wholeness that emerge. This pattern actually tells us a lot about how life evolves. Considering the enduring wonders of creation throughout the universe and how unsustainable so many of our human systems are, I figured learning how the universe creates and sustains life would actually be quite useful. Each of these little packets of wholeness that Einstein discovered, called a quantum, is made out of its surroundings, but is distinct within it, like a whirlpool in water. These packets are always the same pattern, no matter what size, and they are surprisingly relevant to issues as seemingly disconnected as the wars in the Middle East, the global financial collapse, and how to achieve justice for everyone. We're about to explore how. Mathematicians call this pattern the torus. The energy in a torus flows in through one end, circulates around the center, and exits out the other side. It's balanced, self-regulating, and always whole. I was first officially introduced to the torus by scientist and inventor Arthur Young. Futurist Dwayne Elgin explains how the torus is the primary pattern that nature uses for life at every scale. Evolution means to, uh, to unfold, to roll out. So the question is, what is the universe rolling out? And what the universe is rolling out is self-organizing systems. And you can see this at every scale. A self-organizing system is a technical term for just uh, a system getting a hold of itself, uh, knowing itself, essentially. And uh, if we go to nature, uh, we, can, we can look at and we can see the self-organizing forms uh, throughout. We can see it. In, in the cross-section of an orange, the cross-section uh, of an apple. We can see it uh, in the dynamic nature of a tornado. Uh, we can see it in the um, magnetic field around the Earth, a similar magnetic field around a, uh, an individual. We can see it in the structure of an entire whirlpool galaxy. Uh, we can see it in the structure uh, of, a, of a small atom. Uh, at every scale throughout its entire history, the universe has one single project. It's growing toruses. The universe is a torus growing factory. These toroidal dynamics are visible at various scales. One of them is at the galactic level, which are huge spinning structures with billions of stars in it. Looks like typically big arms of galaxies spinning around and they have vortices that goes from the center out to the edge of 
the galactic halo that surrounds them. Stars move from this galactic disk out to the halo, down the vortices, and back out again. Stars like Arcturus, for instance, we know, have done that path already. That's the appropriate description even for the atmosphere of our planet. The weather goes from the North Pole down to the equator and then back up, from the South Pole up to the equator and then back down. Even the dynamics on the surface of the Sun are very similar. Of course, here we're looking at it from an external perspective on a small scale model. When you look at the solar system embedded in the galaxy, embedded in the cluster, embedded in the supercluster, we're traveling in this boundless sea of infinite Taurus flow. The Taurus is like the breath of the universe. It's the form that the flow of energy takes at every scale of existence. But there's also an underlying structure in how the flow fits together, sort of like a skeleton. It's called the vector equilibrium, a term coined by one of the 20th century's greatest thinkers, Buckminster Fuller. Inspired by Fuller's visionary work, I spent decades researching the dynamics of the vector equilibrium and the torus. I became so excited by the potential of the toroidal energy form that in 1997, I co-founded a multidisciplinary think tank called the Sequoia Symposium to study the pattern and explore its applications. Our collected research convinced me that the torus and the vector equilibrium are primary patterns, fundamental to the creation of the universe at all scales. At the Sequoia Symposium gatherings, I learned of inventors who claimed they were using the torus dynamic as the basis for devices that generated energy without combustion. This revolutionary development, accessing what's sometimes called zero point or radiant or free energy, is now being called most simply new energy technology. Given that so much of the suffering in our world is the result of lack of access to energy, I realized that free, unlimited, clean energy would be one of the greatest breakthroughs in history. It could not just improve, but actually transform the quality of life on this planet. So I began to wonder who else knew about this pattern or about this powerful potential energy source. Some of the scientists at the symposium showed me how the Taurus has been encoded by different cultures for millennia. Apparently, ancient cultures had embedded this code in the most enduring forms then possible, in stories, in icons, in alphabets, and buildings. Here we are at one of the world's oldest sacred sites, the Osirian Temple at Abydos, Egypt. Very little writing is found in the Osirian Temple. However, there is one very significant piece of information in that temple. It is a very faint but clear and precise drawing. It's not etched into the rock, it's not carved, it's burnt into the atomic structure of the rock in some extraordinary way. Nassim has decoded the Osirian symbol in three dimensions. Since our world is not two-dimensional, it makes sense that codes relaying information about our world also wouldn't be limited to flat designs. His three-dimensional version of the Osirian symbol starts with the vector equilibrium, a perfectly balanced force field with 12 equal energy lines radiating out. They stabilize its center like the 12 spokes of a wheel. The primary pattern of balanced energy flow around this structure is the torus. Here we expand to the next larger scale, 
with a total of 64 pyramids called tetrahedra. If we then put spheres in, representing the toroidal energy fields surrounding each of the pyramids, and then we drop away the pyramids, we end up with a matrix that is, amazingly, an exact overlay for the Osirian icon, a three-dimensional model of the same pattern that was burned into the rock wall of the Egyptian temple thousands of years ago. Now we travel across continents, from Egypt to China, where the same geometry appears at another sacred site built in 1420. Then you go to the Forbidden City, where the sun gods reside, and where you find at the entrance the Fu Dogs, the guardians of the knowledge. They guard the knowledge under their paw. The same geometry of 64 energy units is encoded again. I started wondering, is it just a coincidence that the exact same design appears in significant places on two different continents? But then Nassim showed me that this geometry of 64 is encoded time and again in cultures across the centuries and from all over the world. The Hebrew Kabbalistic Tree of Life creates the same structure we just saw with the vector equilibrium again embedded at every level. The ancient Chinese system of wisdom called the I Ching is based on 64 hexagrams, symbols with six lines in a set, some continuous, some broken. These can be put together as the six edges of a tetrahedron and together would form the 64 tetrahedron crystal. This same pattern shows up in modern scientific research. The double helix has an alphabet of 64 codons that are used to encode our human DNA. I had seen that there was advanced knowledge of the living geometry of the universe thousands of years ago, but how on earth did they know about it? Most of the stories of ancient Egypt and Mayan and Incas talk about sun gods coming to the earth and teaching them uh, engineering and writing and all of their science. I started to wonder if all these sun gods were not advanced civilization coming from another part of our galaxy. These texts and many ancient culture describe them as coming in flying boats or in the Vedic tradition flying machines and so on. There is many mention of these sun gods coming through time. Could these early pilots from beyond our world be the ones responsible for sharing the knowledge of this code? Could they actually be tapping its power to propel themselves through the cosmos? This isn't where I thought my research would lead me, and these notions were rocking my world. But Nassim has impressive evidence to back up his theories, and I could see no other rational way advanced math and physics concepts would have been recorded over 3,000 years ago. I sought out one of the most knowledgeable investigators, Dr. Stephen Greer, the founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He's conducted hundreds of interviews with top-ranking government and military witnesses. And so when we talk about extraterrestrial intelligence, we're talking about uh, civilizations that have reached the point of, of being sentient like we are, but whose technologies and perhaps social capabilities are such that they've been able to become interstellar or interplanetary civilizations. And when you look at the fact that the most conservative estimates are in the Milky Way galaxy that there are at least 10,000 Earth-like planets that have intelligent life on them, and that at least half of them are likely to be as advanced or more than ours. It's almost a certainty that there's intelligent life out there that have mastered 
uh, the laws of the universe beyond what's currently taught at MIT and Caltech to be able to transfer through space-time in real time through vast distances of interstellar space. We have over 4,000 cases where these objects have landed on terra firma and left physical evidence. We have over 3,500 pilot cases. We have hundreds of cases, including ones from the highest ranking investigator at the FAA, John Callahan, and numerous other operators where these objects have been tracked on radar going tens of thousands of miles per hour or dematerializing and then reappearing in another point in the sky. Yes, there have been ET visitation, there have been crashed craft, there have been uh, uh, material and bodies recovered. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country but from some other solar system and I have been a party to that. There were documents that I have seen that refer to the Roosevelt uh, having several instances of uh, UFO flyovers and particularly after they took on board uh, nuclear weapons. And my SEAL told me, Jordan, this, you know, what have you got in your log? This never happened. The crew going on duty and the crew coming off duty all saw the UFO just hovering in midair. It was a metallic circular object and uh, from what I understand, the missiles were all shut down. That means that went dead. And something turned those missiles off. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead, tumbles out of the out of space. The feeling at the time was that it must have been extraterrestrial. They took the film and they spooled off the part that had the UFO on it and they took a pair of scissors and cut it off. They put that on a separate reel, they put it in their briefcase, they handed Major Mansman back the rest of the film and said, here, I don't need to remind you, Major Mansman, of the, of the uh, severity of a security breach. We'll consider this uh, incident closed. But who do you tell that you were involved in a UFO incident without them looking at you like you ain't wrapped too tight. Out of all of the evidence for the existence of UFOs, one extraordinary phenomenon continues to astonish and inspire me the appearance throughout the world of so-called crop circles. These elaborate designs appear mysteriously swirled into crops of grain in such a way that the stalks are bent over, yet remain alive. More than 5,000 of these patterns have appeared in over 30 countries, most of them in England. The media has led many people, including me at first, to write these crop patterns off as hoaxes, the nighttime work of a few pranksters. Of course, there have been faked versions, but those made by human hands are crude compared to the vast majority of these elegant creations. Could hoaxers have created all 5,000 of these patterns? Could a few people with ropes and boards have created something as complex and beautiful as this one? made in the dead of night in a driving rain and leaving no footprints in the soil? The electromagnetic field over the area where the crop's been laid down to create the image is often electrostatically charged. Some of these areas are littered with strange magnetic particles. One of the most amazing crop designs is not a circle, but a rectangle that seems to be a direct response to a message sent out into space in 1974. The message was a radio signal depicting our planet's location in our solar system and Earth's people in hopes that it might be received and interpreted by an extraterrestrial intelligence. 27 years later, in 2001, this crop design appeared in England along with what could be a self-portrait of the sender. 
This message matches the format of the NASA signal and describes a different solar system from ours, a picture of the sender, non-human DNA, and a microwave antenna they apparently used to communicate, rather than the radio antenna that we used. The antenna symbol had appeared a year earlier in exactly the same field, right next to a working radio wave antenna, like the one NASA used to send out the original signal. NASA continues to officially deny extraterrestrial contact of any kind. And yet, year after year, these spectacular creations appear. So what might these remarkable designs mean? Here are some two-dimensional versions that seem to be revealing the Taurus in 3D. Here is the vector equilibrium. And the related pattern of 64 that we saw encoded in the arts of so many ancient cultures. When I saw the coherence between the crop circles and the ancient encodings, I thought regardless of whoever created them and wherever they're from, there must be an important purpose to these designs. They're so coherent. I've come to believe that the pattern of the torus and the vector equilibrium, especially in the form of the 64 tetrahedron crystal, is showing us how energy works in the universe so that we can learn to align with it. I believe that they're giving us a model for accessing energy in a clean, safe, and limitless way, and a new means of propulsion. What more important message could there be to get to us, and especially now, from their perspective, as we're beginning to extend our careless reach beyond our planet? I got further confirmation of this notion when I met Dr. Jack Kasher, a former professor of physics at the University of Nebraska, who has also researched UFO phenomena. Presenting at a Sequoia symposium, Dr. Kasher showed a remarkable series of drawings by a woman named Lane Andrews, who claimed to have been invited onto an extraterrestrial spacecraft. I was startled to see her detailed sketches of the toroidal energy field that she said propelled the vehicle and protected the passengers. I subsequently interviewed James Gilliland. James has many hours of UFO footage from his ranch near Mount Adams in Washington State. He also claimed to have gone on board an alien spacecraft. What blew my mind was that he had never met Lane Andrews and had no knowledge of her experience Yet he described a phenomenon that was amazingly similar, numerous ships with spinning rings of light. Could it simply be coincidental that James and Lane described the same Taurus dynamic and that both of these people have been harassed extensively by government and military agencies? To some, the idea of UFOs may sound crazy. And yet from another perspective, it is completely plausible. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old. 
that's 4,500 million years old. What if there's another planet that's almost exactly like us, almost exactly, 4,501 million years old? They're a million years ahead of us. And on a galactic scale, they're almost our twin brothers. So where are we gonna be in a million years? We'll have solved all these problems, and there's another way, uh, whether it's wormholes or warping space. There's gotta be a way to generate energy so that you can pull it out of the vacuum. And the fact that they're here shows us that they've found the way. This is a major uh, shock uh, to the human system that is uh, in process. I understand why people in our generation, people who aspire to positions of political leadership, etc., never dare go near that question because it's a worldview challenge. It's a fundamental worldview challenge. So here we are, a relatively immature species struggling with possible self-destruction. If aligning with the Taurus does hold the key to a new form of clean, safe energy access, imagine the implications. This could be the most important technology breakthrough of our times. So who wouldn't want to have an energy source that's unlimited and freely available? That turned out to be a key question. And that's what led me down the next rabbit hole. It turns out that scientists as far back as the early 1900s have been developing alternative ways to access electricity without combustion. Nikola Tesla believed he had tapped into what he called radiant energy. Many scientists believe he was accessing what's now called free energy. But before Tesla could finish the project, his financier, banker J.P. Morgan, who had a monopoly on the copper used for electrical lines, recognized how Tesla's invention could transmit electricity without wires. He then shut down Tesla's funding. Tesla's lab was burned down and he was ostracized, all for trying to implement his vision of unlimited energy for everyone. A modern day inventor, Adam Trombley, was inspired by Tesla's work and by the possibilities of the Taurus. Trombley built a dynamo, a direct current generator that accessed electrical power right out of the air. We were trying to demonstrate that by mimicking the magnetic field of a planet and rotating this device, we could actually create a dynamo that would work. And in fact, it did work and it does work. So when we contemplate nature, when we contemplate Jupiter, or we contemplate a dynamo like the Earth rotating in space, we're basically talking about a magnet which is rotating in space. And the lines of flux of the magnet are pouring down and through in this toroidal pattern of the magnetic field. It's also expanding and contracting. It's breathing. It's taking in the energy of space, literally, and transforming it. Right here in this toroid, we have enough energy to transform the entire Earth. And that's not just a theoretical statement, it's literally true. To contemplate the implications of this means that every single place on Earth suddenly has power. Every single person on Earth suddenly has power. We have universal abundance. Trombley had been invited to demonstrate one of his generators at the United Nations and the U.S. Senate. But these events were undermined by the first Bush administration. Then the device itself was taken in a government raid. Trombley's experience isn't unique. Almost every time I found an inventor with a promising new technology in the field of free energy, he told a similar story of suppression. Inventor John Bedini began working with Tesla's theories of radiant energy decades ago and has produced an assortment of battery charging devices that generate more energy than it takes to run them. He announced that he was going to start offering them at low cost. Soon after that, he was attacked in his lab and warned not to produce the devices. For his own safety, he had to let go of marketing free energy. These are all devices from labs I personally visited.
Now the quality of this footage is obviously poor and I'm not expecting this to convince you. My point is that being there with these inventors, accompanied by experts, and seeing these new energy devices in operation convince me that the technology is real. And the implications of that to me are absolutely thrilling. Canadian John Hutchison not only created some free energy batteries, but also used Tesla's theories to counter gravity, to make objects float. This could revolutionize the field of propulsion. His lab was raided and equipment was taken by police and government officials in 1978, 1989, and again in 2000. One of the scientists we were going to interview for this film was Dr. Eugene Malov, an engineer from MIT and Harvard, an editor of Infinite Energy magazine, which covers both theoretical and technological developments in the new energy field. Dr. Malov was mysteriously beaten to death in 2004. If these inventors were all hoaxers and charlatans, I wondered why are they being suppressed so consistently and so brutally? I asked free energy inventor Adam Trombley why he thought this technology was being suppressed and if the UFO phenomenon was related. We've had major military people at great risk to themselves say, yes, these things are real. Why do you think the military industrial complex doesn't want that statement to be made? Because you start thinking about what kind of technology is behind that. That's the bottom line. The suppression of UFO phenomena is hand in hand with the suppression of so-called free energy. The energy is extracted from the fabric of the space around us which means it cannot be metered. That is a direct threat to the single largest industry in the world, energy. It's goodbye ExxonMobil, goodbye oil, goodbye coal, goodbye linear transmission of electricity through power lines, all that gone. Unfortunately, it's someone's $200 trillion piggy bank. The proven oil and gas and coal reserves are worth north of $200 trillion. This information coming out would completely change geopolitical power more than anything since a well in recorded human history. And it would happen in a generation. I started to examine the breakthrough solutions, and much to my surprise, these concepts have been proven in hundreds of laboratories throughout the world, and yet they have not really seen the light of day. Rather than smashing things together and trying to control the explosion, these new technologies rely on blending, of dancing with what naturally is. The common denominator of all the free energy devices I've seen is that they mimic, in one way or another, the torus energy shape. You don't have to believe in free energy technology to be concerned about the repression of ideas and inventions. I found myself thinking, what better way to justify our dependence on oil, coal, nuclear, and other dangerous and dirty technologies than to claim there are no better, cheaper alternatives? It was my beloved wife and creative partner, Kimberly, who kept bringing me back to the human implications of my scientific research. For me, as intriguing as the Taurus and ETs and free energy are, the most compelling question was, would understanding these things really help alleviate human suffering in any way? And it turns out it can. So much of the pain on the planet has to do with the lack of access to energy. Can you stay warm? Can you get food and water? Can you get hospital care? All that has to do with energy access. If there is a fundamental pattern, which makes sense to me that evolution would be efficient in that way, and we can align with that pattern to create new technologies that will solve these problems, then it's worth it to me to open my mind to these socially taboo subjects. If the new energy technologies were to be set free worldwide, uh, the change would be profound.
It would affect everybody. It would be applicable everywhere. Th these technologies are absolutely the, the most important thing that's happened in the history of the world. So given the stakes, I decided to ask who's benefiting from suppressing scientific research? Whose wealth and power are threatened by access to clean, free energy? Who has a motive to set up a world where so few have so much and so many have so little? As an independent researcher, I followed one of the cardinal rules of investigative journalism. If a story doesn't make sense, follow the money. Our being dependent on oil ensures that energy corporations continue to reap phenomenal profits. I see them committing huge resources to undermine energy alternatives, to control global reserves, and to maintain high oil prices. They have enough money and influence to suppress anything that might threaten their monopoly. So who's behind the huge energy corporations? The Rockefeller's oil empire got started in 1870 when John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil and became America's first billionaire. Standard Oil has since morphed into ExxonMobil and others. And the Rockefellers control our food as well. They were primarily responsible for the global shift to large-scale petroleum-based agriculture. I remember the so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Like most people, I thought it was a great thing. It was, however, based on the planting of huge plots with a single crop using vast amounts of oil-based fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. The Green Revolution was the brainchild of the Rockefeller Foundation's Natural Science Division in partnership with large agricultural corporations. Petroleum-based agriculture provided vast new profits for the oil industry but never lived up to its promises of ending hunger and promoting health. The Green Revolution did at first increase productivity because every bit of soil was being used for immediate production. But its true costs can now be seen. Taxpayers pay billions in subsidies to giant agribusiness corporations. Small family farms have all but disappeared. Biodiversity is destroyed Toxic chemicals poison farm workers and pollute the land, water, and our food supply, endangering the health of us all. As of 2010, approximately one in every seven people worldwide did not have enough to eat. The giant corporations who had brought us chemicals for chemical industrial agriculture, and they were talking about three instruments to consolidate the food chain. The first was genetic engineering as a way of control. The second was patenting seed and patenting life as a way of control, declaring seed to be private property, treating the saving of seed by farmers as a crime, as a theft of intellectual property. And the third was so-called free trade treaties that would rob ordinary people, farmers, growers, of their freedom to save seed. The design of Terminator technology to create sterile seed in order to impose even more dependence of humanity on a handful of cooperation is the ultimate step in this. We are, through what we are doing with seed, literally for the first time, creating a new colonization, which I call the colonization of the future. So in two crucial areas, energy and food, the same elite banking families and their corporations have taken control, and the consequences have been devastating. For me, it was overwhelming at first to discover such a monopoly of influence, but I knew it was important, like learning you have a tough but treatable disease. It helps to understand what's causing it and how it operates if the goal is to cure it. So I continued my investigation. If oil and food are controlled by the big banking families, where else does their influence show up? As I followed the money, I began to see this same pattern of control in just about every area of our lives. 
and I always found the same families in charge, either directly through their banks and corporations or indirectly through their major foundations. Again, it was the Rockefellers who created the National Education Association with help from the Carnegie Foundation and later from the Ford Foundation. What the captains of industry wanted from our schools was an obedient and docile workforce who would be manageable employees and eager consumers. Schools are to establish fixed habits of response to authority. That's why it takes 12 years. You're to respond reflexively when anyone in a position of authority tells you what to do. Like education, health is yet another area dominated by big money and corporations. The American Medical Association, for example, is largely funded by the Rockefellers who use their funding to influence AMA research and decision making. The average MD in four years of medical school takes one course in nutrition, two and a half hours in many cases, and this, the materials used, the curriculum materials, are supplied by the National Dairy Council and the National Livestock and Meat Board and other industries, including the Sugar Association, with products to sell that actually undermine our health in the first place. Unfortunately, the way the system of medicine is set up, medical education is primarily uh, you know, funded by pharmaceutical companies. So there's a motive to make and sell as many drugs as possible. It's also a very time-effective way of making money for the physician, for the pharmaceutical company, for the whole medical establishment. But it's really perpetuating the problems it was meant to alleviate. Side effects may include nausea, dry mouth, and constipation. Decreases in white blood cells, which can be serious. Sexual side effects, diarrhea, nausea, and sleepiness can lead to coma or death. How far will these forces go to make a profit? Would they actually suppress cures for diseases the way they've suppressed free energy technology? Sadly, my research has shown me the answer is yes. One well-documented example is the case of Dr. Royal Rife. In the 1920s, Dr. Rife invented the most advanced microscopes of his time. He also developed a new technique he called coordinative resonance, which was apparently able to destroy cancerous tumors as well as viruses. In 1934, in clinical trials affiliated with the University of Southern California, Rife's treatment was tested on 16 terminally ill cancer patients. Within three months, they were all successfully cured. Soon after, a lab testing Rife's technology was burned down and a frivolous lawsuit was filed. Through the efforts of Morris Fishbein, head of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Rife was essentially shut down and ruined, his brilliant and promising work all but forgotten. It was really hard for me to consider that someone might actually be suppressing cures. And cancer has run through my family like a raging river. I found out that it's all about patents. If a pharmaceutical company can patent and make money from treatment, especially one that we have to keep on using, then that's what we get. Otherwise, we don't even hear about it. It's not just Rife who got shut down. Reen Case had an old Indian Ojibwe formula that was effective. Harry Hoxie and Max Gerson had natural remedies that worked. But you know, if you go and you look them up, the AMA makes them sound like complete quacks. And that's where following the money has been so helpful because the same powers who control the AMA and their research and funding control the pharmaceuticals. So there's a multi-trillion dollar financial incentive to suppress cures that can't be patented. Knowing that cures exist has not taken away the anguish I feel from losing so many people I love to cancer. It's given me something really satisfying to do with the pain. And I believe when we take the love and devotion that we have for everyone who's died and who will die unnecessarily, and direct it to developing and getting these cures out to people who need them, we can break this cancer legacy and heal. As difficult as it was for me, I have come to an inescapable and profoundly disturbing conclusion. 
I believe that an elite group of people and the corporations they run have gained control over not just our energy, food supply, education, and health care, but over virtually every aspect of our lives. And they do it by controlling the world of finance, not by creating more value, but by actually controlling the source of money. When I followed the money, I found that it took me up the levels of a pyramid. Here we are at the bottom level going about our daily lives. Above us is government, people who are given a monopoly on force and use it to tax and control us whether or not we agree. But who controls them? At the next level are the corporations. Many would say that it is now corporations and not nation states that rule the world. They call it a corporatocracy. To acquire the world's resources and control the markets, this corporatocracy must have access to cheap money. The big corporations get their loans at special rates from the big banks, which means that those who control the major banks, the money elite, ultimately control the corporations. As I've followed the money, I've learned that almost everything I once believed about money is simply not true. It's um, interesting how few questions we actually ask about very everyday things, like when we go into a bank and we ask for a loan of, say, $50,000, 50,000 pounds, what actually happens? You see, most people live their lives based on a kind of vague image of what happens. What actually happens is, you ask for 50,000 pounds, they type into your account 50,000 pounds. That's all they do. They don't uh, mint any coins, they don't print any money, they don't move any precious metal anywhere, they just put 50,000 pounds into your account on a computer screen. From that moment, you start paying interest on money that has never, does not, and will never exist. It turns out that banks actually have about nine times as much money loaned out as they have on reserve in their vaults. This is possible because of what's referred to as fractional reserve lending. The way it works is that the Federal Reserve, or the central bank in any country, is legally allowed to determine the amount a bank must have on reserve. In the US, it's currently around 10%. So if you deposit $10,000 into the bank, the bank sets aside 10% or $1,000 and then loans out the rest of your money. The way it works is say another person comes into the bank and asks for a car loan of $9,000. At this moment, the bank loans out the $9,000 from your original deposit. It isn't there anymore. The borrower then pays the person selling the car and they go deposit the money into another bank, which is part of the same central banking system. This $9,000 is treated as a new deposit and the process continues. The money gets redeposited and reloaned until the initial deposit of $10,000 becomes $100,000. The banking system just created $90,000 by loaning out your money. Apparently, it began with the goldsmiths in the 17th century, when people were trading in gold. Gold was heavy to carry around, so people stored the actual metal in vaults and traded receipts instead. Those receipts were the first paper money. Since only a few people would withdraw their gold at any given time, the vault owners, basically the new bankers, began creating receipts for more metals than they actually held. They loaned out those receipts and charged interest on money, gold, that they didn't really have. That's how our so-called fractional reserve system was born. In this system, the bankers get to make up money out of nothing, while the rest of us have to work hard to earn it. It has created a modern form of serfdom where the mass of society is now working to pay off their debt to the banks. Under this fractional reserve scheme, we inevitably become debt slaves to a ruling class of financial elite, not because they are better or smarter than anyone else, but because they have rigged the system to benefit themselves at the expense of most people on the planet.
Catherine Austin Fitz is an expert on this issue. She was an assistant secretary of housing and urban development under President George Bush Sr. and then an advisor to the Clinton administration. Let's set up a game of Monopoly and you want to buy Park Place. Um, what I can continually do is just print money, give myself more money, lower the value of your money by printing more. No matter how hardworking you are or how successful you are, I can always end up buying you for free. So how come if you or I make up money, it's called counterfeiting? But if the banks do it, it's increasing the money supply. How did the banks get this power? This is Jekyll Island, where in 1910, representatives from the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, Morgans, and other private bankers gathered secretly to draft the legislation that would create the Federal Reserve. Ed Griffin literally wrote the book on what happened at Jekyll Island. Central banks are banking cartels which have gone into partnership with the respective governments in the countries where they operate. And they've been given monopolistic power over the creation of the nation's money supply. That's what the politicians handed to them as a gift, you might say, for the partnership. Now, in return, what did the bankers do for the politicians? They promised to create money out of nothing. Now that they've got this legal power to do it, any time the government needs it. And since 2008, we've witnessed the greatest fake money printing run in recorded history. This financial sleight of hand disguises the costs, hides who's to blame, and leaves us as debt slaves working to pay off the bill. I found it revealing that in the same year the Federal Reserve was founded, 1913, the Internal Revenue Service was also established. An income tax was then instigated so you and I would have to pay the politicians' debt plus interest to the bankers. The problem is we have a privately owned central bank system uh, in the United States disguised as a government-owned system. Now, if you look in the, the uh, uh, telephone book here in the Washington, D.C. area, um, you look up for Federal Reserve in the blue government pages, it's not there. It's in the white pages right next to Federal Express. It's a privately owned central bank. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. We have a private bank that prints money on behalf of the Treasury. The Federal Reserve prints money on a debt-based system which creates scarcity, but it puts a group of insiders in a position of having access to all the data about the economy when we don't. So you have a, a small group of bankers who understand the data on how the money works in the economy, and it gives them the ability to print money in a way that the insiders are protected and everybody else is drained. Catherine went on to compare a healthy economy to a vibrant torus, balanced, freely flowing, and energized throughout, in contrast to what's happening in our current economy. What, what you have is, uh, is a system that's very dynamic, and it's trying to optimize. Um, but, but intertwined in the core of it, you have a tapeworm. The way a tapeworm works in your body is it injects a chemical into your body that makes you crave what's good for the tapeworm and bad for you. You have a parasite that's, that's very much manipulating and engorging itself at, at the expense of the whole. We live in a tapeworm economy where the financial elite are the tapeworm and they're feeding on us. And they don't like it when people blow their cover. After Catherine began exposing government corruption at the highest levels, the FBI raided her company and seized its assets. She was dragged through the courts for 10 years before being found innocent. So we've got the Federal Reserve, a privately owned corporation with a monopoly on creating money, 
but with no accountability, backed up by a government with a monopoly on force. The country got sold on the Fed as an institution that would help stabilize the economy and remain independent of politics. But in fact, in close to a century of existence, the Federal Reserve has done just the opposite. Since they took charge, we've been robbed through inflation, and the purchasing power of the dollar has declined more than 96%. And the wealth gap makes it clear most of the money is going to a very few. Only 16 years after the Federal Reserve was in power, America experienced the Great Depression. My research revealed that before the big crash in 1929, the elite bankers pulled their money out of the stock market. After the crash, they used that money to buy up cheap stocks and smaller failing banks for pennies on the dollar. Among the bankers who consolidated their wealth this way were the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Morgans. A similar scenario played out in the 2008 financial collapse, with the same bankers benefiting. In the years leading up to the collapse, the biggest banks, including Bank of America, Citigroup, and Chase, controlled by the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Morgans, were bundling and trading bad loans that they knew would eventually fail. It's like putting rotten oranges in a box and selling them as grade AAA. The bundlers of the debt knew it was only a matter of time before someone would open that box and see that the content was worthless, since they were the ones who packed the boxes in the first place. When the rotten oranges, what we hear about as unsound loans, derivatives, and credit default swaps were finally discovered, everyone was impacted. People lost their homes, their jobs, their businesses, and their retirements. Meanwhile, the biggest banks who created the problem in the first place were the ones who got bailed out. Why is that? Why would the Federal Reserve give trillions to the banks, even though the majority of Americans were against bailing them out? And why not help those most in need rather than the perpetrators of the financial collapse? My research led me to believe that the same people who created the Federal Reserve, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans, still control it, and they use this scheme to bail themselves out at our expense. Many of the banks created are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill, uh, and they, frankly, own the place. I'm convinced that the near collapse of the economy in 2008 resulted from an orchestrated pump and dump scheme designed and executed by the big bankers to consolidate wealth and power. David Icke explains how he sees the Federal Reserve rigging the so-called business cycles. Stage one, it's like throwing a fishing line out. Stage one, you put lots of money, units of exchange, into circulation. You do this by pushing interest rates down, by making lots of loans. This is the part of the cycle we call a boom. Because there's lots of units of exchange in circulation, there's lots of money changing hands. That generates lots of economic activity. That generates jobs. And as more and more money is spent, there's more demand, so companies take out more loans of fresh air money to increase their production. People get confident in their everyday lives. Hey, you know, I work for this company. They've got lots of orders. Ah, it's really going great. My job's safe. I tell you what, we can have a bigger house. Then they start to change it. What they do is they pull the fishing line in. They push interest rates up. Now, fewer people, um, A, um, are taking out loans and they make the criteria for having a loan from the bank stronger anyway. And also, now, as interest rates have gone up, a larger part of people's income is going to pay back the extra interest and not being circulated in buying things. Suddenly, there's nothing like as much money in circulation, and therefore, fewer things are being bought. Companies start to go down in terms of their profits. They start to shed jobs and they start to go out of business. People 
lose their jobs, they can't pay the mortgage anymore of the big house they took out in the good times. Now what the banks are doing is starting to reel the fishing line in because as they go bankrupt, companies and individuals, the banks get the real wealth, the property, the land, the resources that they had signed to them for lending merely figures on a screen. Now this economic cycle of fishing line out, fishing line back, lots of units in circulation pull them in, has been going on for centuries. And what it's done, it's stolen and accumulated the real wealth of the world in the hands of the few. At the international level, central bankers use the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to make more money while exploiting the resources of countries they lend to, bankrupting them in the process. The Central Bank of Central Banks is the Rothschild-created Bank for International Settlements. The elite are positioning themselves to control access to virtually everything we need to survive. No matter where you go in the world, the money is controlled by the banking system. They decide if people eat or if they don't eat. Who's a billionaire and who lives on less than a dollar a day? He who controls the money controls the world, and a very few control the money. At this point, my view of the world had been turned upside down. I was struggling with the realization that the failure and suffering of so many is actually success and fulfillment for a few. The elite central bankers who fooled the world into letting them create money. They already have vast fortunes, so what is their end game? What is their ultimate agenda? I kept running across compelling evidence and credible experts saying that the secret agenda of the banking elite is nothing less than total global domination. At first, I resisted the idea, but I was committed to finding out what was keeping us from thriving, no matter where it might lead. One night I woke up at 3 a.m. with the burning question, if this small group wanted to dominate the entire world, what would they need to control to accomplish it? I jumped out of bed and started making a list. First and foremost, they'd have to control money, and they do. Controlling money allows them to run everything else. They'd need to control energy, and they do. They already control big agriculture and world trade. They're buying up water supplies worldwide. They've got health in their pocket, and they're trying to suppress natural alternatives. Mainly, they'd have to control what information we'd get and how we'd react to it. In America, the internet, our greatest tool for communication and grassroots organizing, is currently not controlled or censored, but its open status is being attacked from all sides. Governments, corporations, and the United Nations are all attempting to take control. For complete domination, dissent has to be controlled. They'd need to take away our rights, spy on ordinary citizens, and track every aspect of our lives. As the day dawned, I knew that a powerful elite had almost everything set up to rule the world. And I had the frightening realization that Big Brother is not just coming, he's here now. We are already in the matrix, so how do we get out? To envision in that, I realized I needed to discover what their ruling structure looks like and how it works. A relatively small group of families, especially the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, Morgans, and Carnegies, along with the Harrimans, the Schiffs, and the Warburgs, have been leading the controlling elite in the West for generations. 
I'm not implying that every individual in these families is aware of or active in the global domination agenda. However, I'm convinced the heads of these dynasties control the corporate and banking interests that carry out the sinister scheme that is destroying so many lives. Those secretly driving the agenda have been known by many names. Leaked reports confirm that they meet throughout the world behind closed doors to discuss their agenda. Then, like clockwork, their plans begin to show up in the media, finance, corporate, government, and military arenas. Of course, not everyone involved in these groups is in on the decision-making. There is a hierarchy of knowledge and participation. One of the primary symbols of the controlling elite is the all-seeing eye. It's on the dollar bill. It's on the American mass surveillance system initially called Total Information Awareness. It's on the British intelligence agency MI5. And it even oversees the Supreme Court complex in Israel, designed and funded entirely by the Rothschilds. I believe they've taken the majestic image of the Cheops Pyramid and its legendary metallic capstone and perverted the meaning to represent those at the top being able to track and control all those under them. One of the painful ways this information has been used is by people who want to promote anti-Semitism. They wrongly call this a Jewish agenda and continue the ongoing racism that undermines and destroys so many lives. Let me be clear, this is definitely not a Jewish agenda. It's been documented that central bankers even funded both sides of World War II as well as some of the corporations associated with Hitler's atrocities against the Jews. Since these people have more money than their families would need for generations, and since they have the power to create money, I don't believe wealth is their end goal. After you have all the material things that you could possibly want in life, what is left to excite you? And for many people, the answer is power, global power. They became intellectually elite. They began to think that they had a plan that was better than anybody else's plan. They got the idea that freedom is dangerous. If you give people freedom, you know what? They're probably not going to use it wisely like we think they should. We are smarter than they are. And for their own good, we should rule them. As I came to accept the idea of a ruling elite planning for total global domination, I began to hear these same people actually talking more boldly and publicly about it. Only they call it the New World Order. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this New World Order. It is a New World Order with significantly different and radically new challenges. A new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. Given the condition of our world, a new world order can sound like a great idea. But I had to distinguish between what I was discovering about global domination, a one world government run by an elite few, and the reality of our global interconnectedness which is the realization that at a fundamental and even spiritual level, we are not separate, we are all connected. But the agenda for global domination is really the exact opposite. It's a divide and conquer strategy to keep us all pitted against each other, thinking that it's the Democrats or Republicans, the liberals or conservatives who are the problem, when both parties are ultimately serving the same plan. I believe we're heading toward a totalitarian world authority actually a military dictatorship run by a tiny elite who have all the power and make all the rules. If they succeed, there'll be nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Think about it. The whole notion of conspiracy has been so ridiculed that it's socially challenging just to consider it. And there's always a reasonable sounding story to explain any one incident on its own. I personally used to try to justify how the same people consistently ended up with more money and more control by thinking they must just be taking advantage of the situation, but not actually causing it. 
But after nearly a decade of putting the issues and the evidence together, I am convinced it is not random and that a few very powerful banking elite families and their political and corporate partners do have an agenda to dominate and control the rest of us. Once I got the reality and the scope of the agenda, I really had to think, how much do I want to know about this? Do I want to focus on the worst of what human beings are capable of? I decided it is worth knowing who these people are and how their organizations operate, because on the other side of the rage and the sadness are clarity and strength, the power we have to focus our efforts effectively now that we understand what's really going on. The greatest prison that people live in is the fear of what other people think. What happened to me as a result of all the ridicule I went through is that I stepped out of the fear of what other people thought. And it's only when you do it that you realize what a prison you lived in before. And what it gave me um, was a personal understanding of how easy it is for a few to control the many. All you have to do is dictate the norms in society, what is considered right and wrong, moral and immoral, good and bad, sane and insane, possible and impossible. And you build what I call a hassle-free zone. And if you live your life within that zone of perception, belief, and what you say and think, then people will leave you alone because you're normal. Once you step out of that pen and you start to express your uniqueness, what the Illuminati have created is a whole human population of prison warders who are jumping on those that are stepping out of the norm. Um, and, and it's interesting, when you get to the edge of that hassle-free zone in what you say and you think, you're not thinking, if I do, what about the head of the World Bank? What's he going to say if I do this? No. We're saying, what will my mother think? What about the guys down the bar and the people at work? What will they say? And what, what the Illuminati have done by creating the norms, they have created a absolute army of people to impose those norms on each other. Their grand strategy for global dominance is already being implemented. They are carving up the world into super states that transcend national boundaries so that we are easier for them to manage. They have already established the European Union and the African Union. Politicians from the United States, Canada, and Mexico, under the title of the Security and Prosperity Partnership, have been working on the northern part of what could arguably be called plans for an American Union. This has been going on for years without citizen or congressional consent. A Pacific Union is already in process. This is the organizational chart for global tyranny. The structure for complete control. Here are two of the most powerful men in Europe talking about moving to a single world government. It is extremely important that we, in this new ownership of global governance, have particularly on both sides of the Atlantic, the implementation of the same rules in the same fashion. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. On the international level, the central banking elite have put huge organizations in place to implement their policies, including the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. John Perkins is a man who knows from decades of his own experience as a so-called economic hitman, how the collusion of banks, corporations, and governments has taken over countries around the world. We use many techniques, but probably the most common is that we'll go to a country that has resources that our corporations covet like oil, and we'll arrange a huge loan to that country from an organization.
like the World Bank or one of its sisters, but almost all of the money goes to U.S. corporations, not to the country itself. Corporations like Bechtel and Halliburton, General Motors, General Electric, these types of organizations. And they build huge infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, highways, ports, industrial parks, things that serve the very rich and seldom even reach the poor. In fact, the poor suffer because the loans have to be repaid, and they're huge loans, and the repayment of them means that the poor won't get education, health, and other social services, and the country is left holding a huge debt by intention. We go back, we economic hitmen, to this country and say, look, you owe us a lot of money, you can't repay our, your debts, so give us a pound of flesh. But as soon as one of these anti-American presidents is elected, one of us goes in and says, hey, congratulations, Mr. President. Uh, now that you're president, I just want to tell you that I can make you very, very rich, you and your family. I've got several hundred million dollars in this pocket if you play the game our way. If you decide not to, over in this pocket I've got a gun with a bullet with your name on it uh, in case you decide to keep your campaign promises and throw us out. Sell our oil companies your oil real cheap or vote with us at the next UN vote or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world such as Iraq. And in that way we've managed to build a world empire with very few people actually knowing that we've done this. Like many people, I thought a conspiracy for global domination could not really work because basically people are just not that competent. I thought there's no way they could pull off such a scheme at the necessary level of control and secrecy. One of the false hopes is this is all happening because government is incompetent mm -hmm. and it's a giant mistake and people really don't know. And of course that's great air cover for the fact that the system really does know where it's going and it's going where it wants to go and it's being successful at it. Still, I wondered how could something that is so big and corrupt be kept secret? It's uh, a, a simple structure, and if it wasn't simple, it wouldn't work. Um, and it can be likened to a compartmentalized pyramid. If you look at any organization today, no matter whether it's a transnational corporation, a university, a government, a secret society, they're all structured as a pyramid. And as the CIA and other intelligence agencies uh, talk about, they have this need to know uh, system. Um, only let people know as much as they need to make their contribution and no more. So um, you take a bank, an individual bank, uh, not that there is such a thing. At the bottom you've got the people you see when you pass your check over the counter in the bank. Now they don't know what the bank manager behind them knows and is discussing. They only know what they need to know to do their job. The bank manager in the office behind them, he doesn't know or she doesn't know what's happening at the next level and they don't know what's happening at the next level. And eventually you've got a tiny few people at the peak of the pyramid of that banking structure. They're the only ones that know what the real agenda of the bank is and what the direction um, is that they're going and why. This kind of compartmentalization explains how the Manhattan Project, which developed the atom bomb in World War II, was kept secret despite having 130,000 people working on it. When I first let in the scale and the intentions of the agenda, I felt like I had the flu for about two weeks. But then it dawned on me. Here was this well-planned, well-orchestrated attempt to squelch human potential, and still our brilliance shines through. Even though we've been systematically distracted and repressed, people have come up with innovative, ingenious solutions to a huge number of the problems that we face. It's not our fault that we didn't recognize how organized and intentional this scheme is. It's our challenge. I looked at the kind of world the controlling elite have already given us, and I had to ask, what kind of world would we be living in if they had absolute and complete domination over everyone, everywhere? In this new world order of theirs, a tiny number of people would exercise total control over the lives of everyone through a system of intrusive surveillance, violence, suppression of dissent, and debt slavery. Imagine tiny islands of opulence surrounded by a sea of misery, where the mission of the military is to protect the haves from the have-nots. I've come to believe that their end game is truly ominous and that they will stop at nothing to continue implementing their plan. 
As difficult as it may be for Americans to accept, I'm now convinced the agenda of the global elite includes destroying the financial strength and sovereignty of the United States. With its history of free speech and armed revolt, America represents the major hurdle to global consolidation of power. If they can succeed in bringing down this country, I believe the international elite intend to transfer the power and productivity of Americans to their one world dictatorship, gradually taking over our lives in what David Icke calls the totalitarian tiptoe. Think about it. They've got us so deep in debt we can never repay it. They're collapsing the dollar and they're attempting to replace it with a global IMF currency. This press for a global cashless electronic currency would enable a central authority to financially disable any individual or group in an instant. Now, for the first time in history, international taxes are being proposed under the pretense of addressing climate change. Like a Trojan horse, the suggested treaty unveiled at the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Conference appealed to our concern for the environment while distracting us from the fact that this unprecedented carbon tax would be paid to the World Bank and enforced by global police. There are ways to address our obvious need to curtail pollution without creating a tax base for tyranny. You want to change society in a way that you know that if you do it openly, you know you're going to get an adverse reaction. So you don't do it openly. You play problem, reaction, solution. Stage one, you create a problem. It could be a terrorist bomb, it could be a 9-11, it could be a run on a currency, it could be a stock market collapse, a government collapse. You tell the people your version of A, who did it, and B, why. And at this point, problem, reaction, solution would fall down if we had a media that was in any way related to journalism. Instead, the mainstream media is a public relations office for the official version of events. Turns out President George W. Bush was right about Saddam Hussein hiding weapons of mass destruction. The virtually only um, way or source of information that the public have about this event is from the mainstream media. And what they're looking at stage two of problem, reaction, solution is the reaction of outrage of key, key, key fear and they want the public to say to the government, something must be done, this can't go on, what are you going to do about it? And this allows stage three, which is those who've created the problem, glean that public reaction with a false story to then openly offer the solutions to the problems they have themselves created. The idea of using tragedy, manufactured or simply utilized, was deeply significant in my finally understanding how far these people will go to achieve their goals. It's a documented fact that we entered the Vietnam War under false pretenses. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara has acknowledged that the attack on a ship in the Gulf of Tonkin didn't actually take place. Our judgment that we've been attacked that day was wrong. It didn't happen. More recently, former President Bush used non-existent weapons of mass destruction as a pretext for invading Iraq. Tactics like this are sometimes referred to as false flag operations. An increasing number of people believe that 9-11 was a false flag operation by the global elite in order to set the stage for taking over Middle East oil and dismantling U.S. constitutional protections. There are lives in the valley. There are people under fire. There are children at the cannon. There is blood on the wire. There is blood on the wire. There is blood on the wire. There is. Most of what's needed for a police state is actually already in place. Right now in America, any of us can be imprisoned without warning or due cause, and we can be kidnapped, tortured, and assassinated legally if the government decides what we are doing is a threat to their plan. All they have to do is name us as a suspect in their so-called war on terror. 
were being watched more and more. In 2010, there were 30 million surveillance cameras recording us in the U.S. alone. When we demonstrate, we're now relegated to what are euphemistically called free speech zones. Zones for free speech? Every phone call and email we send is collected and archived and can be inspected at any time. Our driver's licenses and passports have computer chips implanted in them to track our every move. And now hospital patients are getting these same chips implanted under their skin. In fact, it was Procter & Gamble who developed these chips, initially for tracking their products. It's always offered as a way to help, but even an assistant director of Central Intelligence has admitted it's an entry point to getting all of us chipped for better tracking and control. These would-be controllers, through the U.S. Space Command, have outlined a plan called Full Spectrum Dominance. Sophisticated satellite surveillance, as well as directed energy and laser weapons, which are already developed, have the ability to target dissenters anywhere on Earth. I believe they are also trying to ensure they can deal effectively with any resistance. FEMA containment camps and railroad cars with shackles have been recently constructed or refurbished all over the United States for use in what officials call times of pandemic or civil unrest. There's one more brutal realization about the global domination agenda that I need to share. This was a horrible one for me to grasp, but without it, this inquiry would be dangerously incomplete and our solution strategies would be inadequately informed. In my research, I came across convincing evidence that their plan actually includes the elimination of the majority of the world's population. As sick as it sounds, it makes sense that they would be better positioned to succeed in their quest for absolute control if there are fewer of us to manage. Every time I've thought they wouldn't do that, I discovered I was wrong. I found startling documentation that eugenics is one of the core pillars of their plan. Eugenics is the practice where some people get to decide who's worthy to breed and who's not. Sterilization is one of the many insidious ways this covert plan is being implemented. In 1904, the Carnegies funded the first eugenics laboratory in Cold Spring Harbor, Long Island. The Rockefellers funded involuntary sterilization of people of color through their eugenics programs and funded the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Germany to further the racial supremacy agenda later adopted by Hitler. In 2007, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Homeland Security funded a proposed project to aerial spray over 7 million people in urban areas of Northern California. After citizens organized against the plan, officials were forced to reveal that the spray included multiple toxins that can cause disease and disrupt the reproductive cycle. Fortunately, civil resistance stopped the project. The U.S. government has been caught over 30 times covertly experimenting with toxic chemicals on its own citizens, from soldiers, prisoners, and Native American reservations to entire towns and counties. Mass covert sterilization of women and girls, usually using secret additives to vaccines, has been exposed in Brazil, Puerto Rico, Nicaragua, Mexico, and the Philippines. These have been under the auspices of such programs as John D. Rockefeller's Population Council, the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, where Nelson Rockefeller was undersecretary, and the Rockefeller-founded World Health Organization. Novartis and Syngenta, in cooperation with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Defense, have field-tested a spermicidal strain of GMO corn that would render male consumers infertile. This was quietly announced as a contribution to the world overpopulation problem. The list goes on and on. Right now, global human fertility is plunging. 
I'm convinced that this is no accident. For me, being willing to consider and research a direct depopulation agenda was critical to my getting the whole picture and to generating responses that could be sufficient to the task we face. I know this may sound crazy, but imagine that it's 1932 and we're in Germany. If I told you that in the next decade millions of people would be exterminated, you would say impossible. No one would do such a thing. This is what depopulation looks like today. I'm convinced that I'm not overstating the case. Could I be wrong? Perhaps. But what if I'm not? We are at a critical fork in the road in human evolution. One road is leading toward tyranny and possible self-destruction. The other would lead us to a peaceful, healthy civilization based on honoring the rights and freedom of every single person on the planet. To set off in this new direction, it's up to you and me to clear that road. The time has come to say, enough. There is another way. I believe that together we have the knowledge, the resources, and the solutions to meet that challenge. I see this process as nothing less than a struggle for the soul of humanity. It begins with a shift in worldview, answering the question, who are we really? What is human nature? Are we humans what the elite would have us believe? Stupid, greedy creatures who, if left to our own devices, would devolve into violence and chaos, and so for our own good must be ruled over by a self-appointed elite? Or are we naturally caring and creative? I believe when people are healthy and have what we need to survive, we can create a world based on integrity, freedom, and compassion. A world where everyone can thrive. Which of these two views will shape our future? That's our choice now. The agenda of the ruling elite is the product of a destructive worldview based on their beliefs that there's not enough to go around, that some people are more deserving than others, and that their own safety depends on maintaining absolute control over the rest of us. In short, their worldview is based on scarcity and fear. But as powerful as they are, the architects of the New World Order cannot create their dreadful vision without our collusion. To stop them, to render their agenda obsolete, we have to wake up. We have to take action. This is like the, the last effort of a particular phase of civilization. It's its last gasp, really. And I often use the metaphor of the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. Because the caterpillar crunches its way through the ecosystem. It's very destructive. It eats 300 times its weight in a day until it's so bloated that it hangs itself up and goes to sleep. And its skin turns into a hardened chrysalis. And then in its body, you get these imaginal cells. Biologists actually call them that forming within the caterpillar's body. The caterpillar's body then actually becomes a nutritive soup for those cells. But what's important about that metaphor is that the old and the new coexist for a while. And it's the job of the caterpillar to preserve its life. It's a desperate government that we have now trying to control oil in the Middle East and wanting now to promote nuclear energy and all these things that they know better, but they have to play out the role of protecting themselves. It's their job. And if you love butterflies, you don't go around stepping on caterpillars. So we can't hate them. It doesn't do any good. But if you want alternative energy, you don't ask an oil economy uh, administration to produce it for you. We have to produce it. We imaginal cells have to show that it's cheaper, more efficient, and, and more effective. 
Our job is to build the new world. If we had the vision and a worldview that says our crisis is a birth and everybody's needed and everybody will have more of what they truly want, you could turn this desperate world into a renaissance of human creativity and love. It may seem that the controlling elite has all the cards, but we have many advantages of our own. First, let's talk numbers. Very few people are consciously perpetrating the domination agenda. Most of those helping to implement the plan don't understand the full picture of what they're a part of. By my calculations, we outnumber the actual architects of the plan by more than a million to one in the U.S. alone. Entrepreneur and environmentalist Paul Hawken estimates that there are now well over one million organizations in the world that work towards social and environmental justice, comprising the largest social movement in the history of humankind. This movement, when connected electronically, could become a network of networks that will be the most powerful activist force for change ever. If you look at the people who are involved with restoring this earth and stopping the damage and resisting the depredation and nurturing change and reimagining what it means to be a human being, and you're not optimistic, then you, you might want to get your heart checked, you know, because there is an extraordinary, beautiful, gorgeous, fierce group of people in this world who are taking this on. The second important advantage for us is that all the power centers that the elite control require our participation. If enough of us withdraw our support, their plan can't work. This is true of the central banks, the military, the corporate media, the government and more. And following the models of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., we have the power of nonviolent non-participation. It takes tremendous energy, resources, and deception to try to dominate the lives of others. In moving toward freedom, on the other hand, we have on our side the evolutionary life force and what Gandhi called Satyagraha, the simple power of truth. In India, we have thousands of villages which are now freedom zones. So we will not accept patenting. We will not cooperate with it, just like Gandhi did not cooperate with salt laws. We will not allow chemicals and genetically engineered crops to enter our ecosystems because they threaten this biodiversity. And this freedom movement, which is a freedom movement for all species, not just for individual humans, is something that's growing so fast and is reflected in the movement for GMO-free zones in Europe. I turn my back and there's another thousand GMO-free zones. 90% of Italy, 90% of Austria. The freedom zones uh, around the seed, around uh, food, are, are creating massive shifts. In Bolivia, a grassroots movement took to the streets relentlessly banging pots and pans and eventually stopped the foreign corporate takeover of their water resources. Though very little is shown by the corporate media, there are countless success stories going on every day all over the world. I wasn't willing to make this film until I knew there were responses that are a match for the crisis. And now the power of the internet enables us to share the breadth and the depth of this research. We've spent years creating a vast website, thrivemovement.com, that brings it all together and makes the information and what we can do about it accessible to everyone. Here you have your very own navigator module to go deeper into the main subjects covered in the film code, problem, and solutions. You can study strategies and tactics and connect with others to take high leverage actions. Every fact stated in this film has been independently verified 
and the references on our website. This sector navigator facilitates whole systems thinking that recognizes that actions in one area impact all the others. The center of the sector navigator is worldview because it determines how we experience everything that happens within and around us. In every sector, you'll find critical issues, resources, group strategies, and individual actions to peacefully and productively affect real change. Our resource tree will link you to the people, organizations, and media that we most recommend to help you get more fully educated and engaged. I was encouraged to find that there are a minimum number of actions which, working together, can tip the scales. It's not endless. Once we see the big picture, we'll look at what each of us can do to help accomplish it. Let's take a look at the strategic antidotes to their economic domination. We need to stop any more bailouts of banks or corporations, dismantle the Federal Reserve, withdraw taxpayer support from central banking agencies such as the IMF and World Bank, allow development of alternative currencies and independent banks, and refuse international taxes. My main emphasis is on solutions in the U.S., because that's what I know best. But just as the predicament is global, so are the principles on which the solution strategies are based. Here are some tactical actions that we can take as individuals that don't take much time or money to make a real difference right now. Get informed, speak up, and connect with others. Bank locally. When we move our money out of the big centralized banks and into locally owned banks and credit unions, we defund the problem and fund the solution all in one move. Buy and invest responsibly. Every dollar you spend sends a message. Join the movement to audit and end the Federal Reserve. It's robbing us. Join a coalition to keep the internet fair and open. Don't let anybody take control over it. Support independent media. Get your information from diverse sources and think about who's funding the news you get. Support organic, non-GMO farming. Join movements to bring about honest elections, including traceable paper ballots, and campaign finance reform. Congress can only be accountable to us when corporations stop funding them. Advocate for renewable and new energy technology. Bring the conversation about free energy out into the open. It will transform the power dynamic on this planet faster than anything in recorded history. Sign up for critical mass actions. It's a strategy to leverage our power by waiting until a huge number of us agree to participate before taking an action. Imagine a million of us acting in unison. Then again, imagine even more. I've been inspired by how many grounded solutions and real life problem solvers there actually are. Akila Sharil's is one person whose work especially touched me. He helped broker a gang truce between the Crips and Bloods. One of the things that we discovered in the process of, uh, of waging peace in the neighborhood was that conflict is healthy. You know, it's actual, it's unresolved conflict that actually leads to violence. When we first launched the peace treaty, we've had, we had a lot of success in our first year. Gang homicides dropped 44% in the neighborhood based upon our actions. Akila describes what happened when two rival gang leaders finally met after the truce. The brother came up to him and told him, man, look, I know you got some hard feelings for me. You know, maybe I got some hard feelings for you. He said, but because of this truce, man, he said, I'm willing to put all of that to the side. And, um, and he stuck out his hand. He hugged him and he said he closed his eyes because he was preparing for, a, you know, a sharp, you know, a knife to enter his back. He was waiting for the, you know, for a bullet you know, to be shot into his stomach. But he said after a few moments, you know, he held that, 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 that embrace. You know, he, he realized that, um, 
you know, that it was genuine. I believe that having a clear picture of our potential is as important as uncovering what stands in its way. So I want to take you to a possible world of the future. It's a world the elite would have you believe is an impossible pipe dream, but I'm convinced it's a world that is utterly within our grasp. We can create a world where people can thrive, where we can feel safe and secure. The air, water, and food are clean. A world where communities are capable of producing their own energy and food, and trade is open and fair. Rather than focusing on punishment, instead justice restores lives and losses. Insurance pays doctors to keep people healthy. Education is voluntary, serving the needs of individuals instead of corporations. We get honest feedback from independent media. There are no subsidies and no bailouts. Imagine that with an honest money system, little or no taxes, and low electric and fuel bills, you would have the money to pay off your home and car and be free to save and invest. You would enjoy more wealth, freedom, and security, all while working the same or probably less. Let's say I started a mutual fund for my neighborhood and all the neighbors had stock, okay? And, and so they healed the environment and their stock went up in value. So instead of getting drained financially, they're making money. They're making money from things that make their kids safer and, and prevent the planet from dying. So you kind of have your cake and eat it too. Instead of working all week to make money and then coming home and trying to save the planet on the weekends, you can spend Monday through Friday making money saving the planet and then, you know, go to the beach. <laughs> this vision of a thriving world is based on what could be called the liberty perspective. There is a simple principle that underlies this approach, non-violation. Nobody gets to violate you or your property and you don't get to violate anyone else, except in genuine self-defense. This is the one rule I've found that every single person agrees with, at least for themselves. I believe that non-violation is the true north of humanity's moral compass and our core navigating insight. This insight can guide us and protect each and every individual as we set up voluntary self-sustaining systems. It is a way of living that I can stand for wholeheartedly and without reservation. I've been profoundly influenced by the work of Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who developed a whole philosophy and economic system based on the core ethic of non-aggression. Motivated by having witnessed the ravages of communism and fascism in Europe, he committed his life to finding a just way. He recognized that those systems as well as socialism and even democracy, wrongly assume the rights of the collective or the group to be more important than those of the individual. I had always gone along with the view that more people will thrive if we consider the group's needs above the individual's. But when I took a closer look, I found it doesn't really work that way. In the name of what's best for the group, governments have been responsible for most of the war, death, and destruction on the planet. More than 200 million individuals were killed in the 20th century alone. So how would applying the principle of non-violation change this dynamic? It would take us from incremental change of a fundamentally flawed system to a complete transformation where not just some or even the majority, but everyone could truly have the opportunity to thrive. In order to implement the principle of non-violation, it makes sense to me to honestly re-examine our past because it doesn't work to try to build a healthy living system on top of an unhealthy one. We have to go back to the most fundamental acts of injustice upon which the country was founded in the seizure of the lands of the people and the slaughter of their women and children uh, in, the, in the, uh, the rendering destitute most of the remnants of these people is such a, an a grievous wrong uh, that we believe that we have to deal with that, to come to grips with that in a fundamental way. Understanding that they're not wrongs that were done and completed, 
uh, 150 years ago. They're wrongs that are continued every single day. So you have, you know, through the history of North America and the United States, over 500 treaties signed with indigenous nations where every single one of them now has been violated. You have, in fact, a tremendous amount of wealth having been generated from indigenous people's lands and resources and billions of dollars every year still being generated by corporations and European nations based on the continued exploitation of indigenous people's lands and resources. If we didn't have large corporations, if we didn't have Western governments defining how you and I were to relate to each other, living here in North America now together, how would we relate to one another? How would we make it different? It's going to take time and courageous effort to shift the consciousness and accomplish the tasks that will move us toward the world I'm talking about. And yet I know of no greater gift that we could give to future generations. We can't do everything at once. I envision three overlapping stages of the solutions process. In stage one, we bring as much integrity as possible to our current systems. If we cut the U.S. military budget in half, it would still roughly equal the defense spending of the entire rest of the world. Between that and getting rid of the Federal Reserve, over a trillion dollars a year would be freed, enough to feed everyone on our planet, deal with social issues, and heal our environment. Many people believe that widespread starvation and poverty are inevitable. But compared to war, eliminating poverty and restoring the environment are cheap. According to Lester Brown's Earth Policy Institute, it would take under $200 billion a year to restore the Earth's environment and meet global social goals. But this stage isn't the end goal of the Liberty Perspective. While stage one has a lot of the compassion typically associated with a liberal Democrat agenda, stage two reflects much of the wisdom of the traditional conservative worldview. In stage two, we shrink government's role to protecting individual liberty and stewarding things we share in common, like ecosystems and the airwaves we use to communicate. As the system gains integrity and we move to sound currency, people will have enough money to have more control over everything that affects them. Stage three grows out of the increasing freedom that people gain in stages one and two as they have more money and more time. There is no involuntary tax and therefore no involuntary governance. There's no monopoly on force. There are rules, but no rulers. Rigorously protecting individual rights turns out to be key for honoring our interdependence. We can be distinct and unified at the same time. As utopian as this can sound at first, I've been thrilled to see how much practical thinking has been done to deal with tough issues like health care, crime, and education. These three stages validate the best of both the liberal and conservative perspectives that have divided us for so long, and then reconcile them at a new level around non-violation, a core ethic we all share. Stage three honors human incentive and finally includes the rights of not just many, not just most, but everyone. The Taurus provides a template for a society based on integrity and wholeness. It conserves what's working. It has built-in feedback so it can self-correct and innovate to maintain balance. We can apply these and other features of the Taurus dynamic to our human social systems. I truly believe that aligning consciously with the fundamental life energy pattern at every level, physical, emotional, mental, interpersonal, and environmental, is ultimately the art, the science, and the celebration of love. And that's what we're here to learn. The fundamental insight of our interconnectedness changed the way I approach everything. In my own life, I found a practical expression of this philosophy in the modern nonviolent martial art of Aikido. It offers powerful guidance on how to respond effectively and non-aggressively to the global domination agenda. Morihei Uyeshiba, its founder, 
taught that to practice Aikido, one must mimic the movements of atoms and galaxies. Just as free energy technology blends with the toroidal pattern to access unlimited power, Aikido, the way of harmony, blends with the energy of an attacker, redirecting it to peaceful resolution. Gandhi and King applied these principles of non-aggressive power at the economic and social levels. If we respond with violence to the domination agenda, other than in self-defense, it would only continue the old us versus them paradigm and provide an excuse for even more police state measures. I believe that it's essential, both morally and strategically, that we take the path of non-aggression there is another aspect of the Taurus that has profound implications for how we can respond to the challenges before us. It is the absolute stillness, the zero point, that lies at the center of each toroidal system. I believe that you and I, as well as every other being, are Taurus energy fields, centered by stillness and each connected to one another and to the boundless consciousness of a living universe. As much as I benefit from the experience of others, as highlighted here with the Navigating Insights, and as valuable as daily feedback is about what's really going on in the world, as we see with the vitals, I've come to recognize that our primary compass is our own inner guidance. As we learn to quiet the noise and amplify the inner signal, we can better hear the voice that naturally knows and offers wise direction. We have a, an entire inner life, a vibrant and lively inner life that is truly the navigator of the path that we take on the outside. If your inner life is the driver of how you show up in the world, it makes sense that if you want to have anything to do with where you're going, that you have to be in relationship to that inner life. You have to be in relationship to the driver as we develop increased relationship to who's in the driver's seat. What happens is that there is a synergy. It's a symbiotic relationship that our inner lives are actually able to be more in tandem with where we're choosing to go and we're able to get there. We're not nearly as insignificant in our impact as we think we are. In order to heal the world, we have to start telling a different story to ourselves. We have to start engaging in a different story with others. It's our collective story that manifests as the world. Humanity is now in a very interesting evolutionary phase in which we move from hostile, aggressive competition, which is the nature of young species, into a more mature mode of cooperation, collaboration. There's no question in this country that money, that capital is being increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few. And uh, those who are so powerful are concentrating it further, but there is a force that's more powerful and that's the power of the people. When we look at the crises now, it is so easy to fall out of love with life. It is so easy to get pessimistic and desperate. But from my perspective, the crisis has matured to the point of being on the threshold of mass awakening. And that, that feeling inside me gives me the vitality to know that you no know, matter how small what I'm doing looks to me in the face of these huge problems, that the impulse of evolution is not small. And when it's in everybody who's waking up, it's huge. And as more and more of us are waking up, linking up, and daring to speak up, the scheme for global domination is being exposed. And we're discovering solutions that can create the world we yearn for and deserve. Again and again throughout history, when people have recognized tyranny rearing its cruel head, they've come together and stood up for liberty. I am confident humankind will look back on this period and be proud that when we saw, we acted. 
Thank you for coming on this journey with us. I'm convinced we have what it takes to thrive. Let's make it happen. Right. 